Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have gathered here today in memory of the late Dan David, a visionary entrepreneur and philanthropist. The Dan David Prize afforded me the opportunity to work with Dan for almost a decade. It was an honor to work with him and to get to know him. It's there. Okay, sorry. Okay. The Dan David Prize afforded me the opportunity to work with Dan for almost a decade. It was an honor to work with him and to get to know the unique person that he was. During that time, Dan became a very dear friend. Dan's vision was to play a significant role in the advancement of humanity and the fostering of future generations of artists, scientists, and leaders worldwide. The realization of his vision was embodied within the concept of the three time dimensions, which honors the accomplishments of human endeavor and which constitutes the framework for the fields in which the Dan David Prize is awarded each year. It follows, therefore, that in his memory, the, cons the concept of three time dimensions is an integral part of this evening. I have the honor to invite Professor Yosef Klafter, President of Tel Aviv University, to address the audience. Thank you very much. Gabi, Ariel, family, friends and colleagues, distinguished laureates of the Dan David Prize, we have all gathered here for this special evening in Dan's memory. Last September, when Dan passed away, we heard many moving speeches about Dan as a war refugee, as an uh, enterprising businessman, as a tireless philanthropist, as a devoted husband to Gabi and father to Ariel, and as the founder of the Dan David Prize at Tel Aviv University. But as time goes on, what we miss even more than Dan the achiever is Dan the human being. We miss his enthusiasm, his creativity, his curiosity, his humor, and even his exacting standards. I half expect him to come in walking now and issue opinions on this very evening. Yossi, he would have said, I could have done it less expensively. <laughs> or why didn't you get sponsors? We miss his energy and true limitless optimism. In his memoir entitled, My Life, My Dreams, that was published in 2009, Dan closed with a short chapter about his 11-year battle with cancer. In the last paragraph, his parting words, he wrote, the universe has given me the most precious gift that anyone can receive, the life to live, and live fully. I have to make the most I possibly can of this gift and to extract the very last drop of life from this blessing. Our blessing here at Tel Aviv University uh, is that Dan brought his zest for living to the university. It infused every project that he was involved in and we are all fortunate to have felt the warm glow of his life force and to have been inspired by his example. Gabi and Ariel, we look forward to working with you and with the Dan David Foundation to keep Dan's very positive spirit alive. Gabi, Ariel, Professor, uh, President Klafter, friends, family, guests from abroad. I would like to speak about uh, several individuals. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to speak about an artist, uh, somebody who was a, an, art, a, an art, artistic photographer briefly before he commercialized photography and, and did it uh, impeccably. Uh, another 
He's a Zionist leader, uh, someone who uh, was a leader in the Zionist youth movement in Romania, went through the Holocaust, saved lives, led people. I remember year in and year out uh, on the eve of the uh, ceremony of the awarding the Dan David Prizes, uh, the, unfortunately, the dwindling numbers of uh, graduates of, uh, of that youth movement coming to pay respect to their leader. He was a friend, but he always was a leader. Uh, a third person was a businessman, an entrepreneur, uh, a remarkable businessman, uh, a businessman who began modestly um, and, and achieved remarkable achievements in, in business, uh, entrepreneurial uh, skills in himself, could identify them in others, and uh, when he did well in his own life, and uh, remember that uh, he had a hard time early on, always wanted to give a chance and opportunity to younger individuals with entrepreneurial spirit who needed a, a helping hand. Yet another person was an intellectual in the true sense of the word, somebody who had curiosity, a creative mind, for whom nothing was too small to be interested or too great to, uh, to comprehend, who, who read voraciously. You only had to mention an interesting book or an article that, uh, that could be read on, on the web and uh, a few days later you would get a comment from, uh, uh, from that intellectual. Uh, a, a, a philanthropist. I, I knew a philanthropist who, who wanted to help people, who liked to help people, who felt that if he was lucky in his own life and, and could afford it, then uh, he should give back to society, to individuals, to institutions, uh, whose philanthropy culminated in the establishment of the prize that uh, carries his name. And finally, a visionary. Uh, there are many philanthropists who, uh, who give on a large scale. There are many uh, businessmen who create new businesses, but not all of them uh, function with a vision. Think big, dare, boldly. And uh, this man I, I had the privilege of knowing was a man of vision, and, and the idea of, of the prize and the way in which uh, the prize was carried out bears testimony to, uh, to that vision. And then, of course, all of these uh, separate individuals, fortunately for, first of all, Gabi and Ariel, but for all of us, merged in one person. It was my personal privilege to know him, first as a, as a lay leader in the university and a donor, of, a very generous donor of the university. And then when uh, we created the uh, Dan David Prize to work very closely uh, with him, and finally, to be designated by him as the chairman of, uh, of his foundation, uh, Dan was not always explicit. Uh, as I said, he was a remarkably intelligent person, and he oftentimes expected you to understand without saying things explicitly. And he never said, I expect you to look after my legacy. But I knew that when he asked me to, invited me to become the chairman of his foundation, what he really wanted was for me to to look after the legacy as embodied in the foundation. This is something I solemnly undertake to do. Thank you very much. Dan had a special love for archaeology and took an active interest in developments in the field. Professor Israel Finkelstein, 2005 Dan David Prize Laureate for the past time dimension in the field of archaeology, had an ongoing dialogue with Dan based on their mutual enthusiasm for understanding past civilizations and cultures. Professor Finkelstein will speak on the topic of modern archaeology, how the future dimension help decipher the past. I'm expected to uh, represent the past, and I'm not so sure how much of a compliment it is. So I decided to speak about the future. I would like to uh, present to you in a very brief way 
the tremendous revolution that has taken place in modern archaeology, in modern archaeology abroad, in the world, as well, as well as in Israel, and I will do so with my own uh, experience in the world of uh, modern archaeology in the last 10 years or so. This uh, has been closely uh, accompanied by the interest of Dan David since uh, 2005, and he uh, visited archaeological sites and was deeply interested in the advances in archaeological research, and especially in the advances of archaeological research in the realm of the exact sciences. The picture that you see now on the screen demonstrates, and the next picture demonstrates well the revolution in uh, modern archaeology and biblical archaeology. This is how archaeology looked like 50, 60, 70 years ago with a horde of uh, workers assaulting a site, almost demolishing it, exposing monuments. The interest was mainly in monuments, and the interest was mainly in the possibility to connect monuments to historical events with special interest uh, in the biblical record, uh, biblical archaeology, which encompasses both the Old Testament and the New Testament. 50, 60 years later, this is how modern archaeology looks. This is a picture from last week from a field uh, uh, expedition, field excavation at Megiddo, together with my uh, colleagues, first of all fr uh, friends and uh, students and postdoctorate uh, students from uh, Tel Aviv University and my colleagues from the Weizmann Institute. We uh, have been uh, granted a very lavish uh, uh, grant from the European Research Council a few years ago, and this uh, work at Megiddo has been carried out with the, in the capacity of this uh, grant in order to track um, uh, uh, evidence for, uh, I mean, it's a geoarchaeological work, in order to track evidence for uh, activity areas of the site and so on. Now, what you see here is a laboratory. This is something that you can see uh, still only here in this country. You can see a laboratory working in the field. This is a big advantage because we can get information from the laboratory about temperature of destruction, about materials, about uh, organic material that uh, can still be found in the sediments, about um, um, uh, uh, elements uh, in the uh, sedimentology which can testify for uh, activity areas, for what people did in one place or another. Now, this is not a small thing because one can say, well, you can do all this after the excavation. Uh, what's the big deal about bringing the laboratory to the field? Well, the big deal is that uh, working together with the people from the exact sciences enables us to ask questions, get answers, and um, uh, uh, formulate the strateg strategy of the excavation on the spot, which means it helps uh, in uh, uh, actually the way that we work in the field. Now, uh, this attracted the attention of uh, people abroad and all over the world, this novel approach to field archaeology, and I'm bringing you here two articles that uh, were published in December 2010, that is to say about 10 months ago in the two leading journals of uh, uh, science in nature on the left-hand side with a picture of Megiddo and in science on the right-hand side saying that a change of biblical proportions strikes Middle East archaeology. The reporter who wrote this uh, uh, article on the right-hand side describing our work attended a conference in Atlanta in November last year where we, a group, a team from this uh, uh, project uh, uh, presented the results of uh, our, our work, the first results. And he sat in the crowd in the last, uh, in a big uh, auditorium in the crowd in the last row and he later described to us the uh, reaction of the people, all of them of our profession, in the crowd as under the title Shock and Awe which means that uh, uh, something interesting is going on here uh, in this uh, 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 new field of uh, exploration, archaeology and the sciences. Now, the truth of the matter is that this field is not new. When I came to the university many years ago to study archaeology, we already studied archaeozoology and archaeobotany and other uh, fields, metallurgy and other fields of the exact and life sciences and their relation to archaeology. But still, uh, some of uh, what I'm going to tell you today is, uh, is new and uh, is the result of uh, efforts of the last uh, few years. 
Let me just uh, give you several examples for this revolution in uh, archaeology from my, my own experience, and I'll do this uh, in a very brief way, in a very informal way, and without going into details. The first example is uh, on the screen now. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a letter which was written 3,400 years ago. Uh, this is a letter uh, which was found in El Amarna in Egypt, which means uh, uh, it uh, was written in the days of uh, Amenophis III, Amenophis IV, the pharaohs of the 14th century BC. There, are, there is an archive of about 400 letters. Uh, many of the letters were sent from petty kings in Canaan. It is very essential for us to know the location of these kings in order to reconstruct the uh, settlement patterns and the territorial disposition in Canaan at that time. This is a period which leads to the rise of ancient Israel, and it has also bearing on understanding the very early record of the Israelite population, if you wish to call them that way, in the highlands. And uh, since the publication of the letters in 1907, uh, there has been a big debate regarding uh, this, the possibility to reconstruct the territorial disposition in Canaan at that time. But, of course, everything was in debate, and the reason is that many of the letters are broken, and the names of the places from which the letters were sent are missing. And other uh, letters, the names are there. In other letters, the name still exists. However, the names are not very clear, because some of the names do not appear in the biblical record later. And those places which do not appear in the biblical record cannot be safely, in most uh, cases, cannot be safely identified. So a few years ago, uh, Yuval Goren, Nadav Neeman, and myself from this university decided to attack the problem from a very different angle, which means to try to apply a technique which uh, had already been known at that time for pottery uh, to uh, clay tablets, which means to take the tablet, take a sample, a small sample, the tablet, after all, was made of the clay, possibly or probably near the location of the sender, and it is possible to take a very small sample from this, this clay, prepare a thin section, look for the mineralogy, and by the mineralogy, according to mineral mineralogy, identify the place from which the letter was sent. And uh, doing that, we uh, really reached some very interesting conclusions uh, 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 concerning locations not only of petty kings in Kenya, but also great empires of the time. There was one big kingdom at the time, the kingdom of Alashia, which is mentioned not only in Egyptian letters, but in other ancient Near Eastern letters of the, th of the Late Bronze Age. The location of Alashia has been in debate, and now we can not only locate Alashia in Cyprus, but also uh, locate the place from which the letters were sent in a precision of uh, about one kilometer, according to the mineralogy of the clay. Another example for modern archaeology is on the screen now. This is an attempt to reconstruct uh, uh, subsistence uh, strategies in an Iron Age site in the Negev Highlands. There, is a wave of set there was a wave of settlement in the Negev Highlands in the uh, Iron Age, in the beginning of the Iron Age, uh, uh, in the 10th, late 10th, 9th centuries BC. And this uh, has also been in a debate, still is in a debate, uh, regarding the uh, exact strategies, whether people also conducted their uh, farming, dry farming, although we are in a desert, uh, in an arid zone, in a desert environment, or only animal husbandry. And by conducting geoarchaeological research in this site, we, that is to say, looking at the sediments and trying to identify particles which uh, are left in the sediments, which come from cells of plants and from the dung, left in the dung, come, uh, coming from the bellies of the animals, we came to the conclusion that uh, in these sites, revolutionary conclusion, I suppose, that these sites practiced animal husbandry but not dry farming, which of course calls for a different um, interpretation to the entire history of the arid zone. One of the most important uh, fields uh, uh, where the exact uh, sciences can really help uh, decipher the past, as I uh, say in the title of uh, this uh, short presentation, is uh, in dating, in uh, radiocarbon uh, dating of uh, organic uh, materials found in archaeological excavations. This is a simple picture from Megiddo. I can show many pictures like this. I present the question to you. Uh, how uh, can we uh, date these walls and basins and elements, including the two destruction layers, which I marked with the red arrows on the screen? 
because the ability to precisely date leads to an ability to reconstruct history. And without precise dating, one can really uh, uh, bias uh, historical research. Now, the problem is, it, sounds, it probably sounds very uh, stupid uh, uh, for you. How can I ask such a question? Well, the problem, there is a major problem here. The problem is that we know very well how to date material in a relative dating, which means we know the pottery sequence, for instance, on the left-hand side of this uh, country. We can really give labels to uh, these uh, pottery assemblages, and then we know which comes earlier and which is later, but this does not give us absolute dates. In order to reach absolute dates, we need to find, either to find uh, finds with the names of Egyptian monarchs or Assyrian monarchs, in uh, the uh, excavations in a very uh, secure context, or to go to the exact sciences, and I mean here radiocarbon studies, which is much safer and much more secure, as far as I can judge, than assumptions on historical events or even Egyptian finds which can travel between strata and so on. So we go to radiocarbon uh, dating, and radiocarbon dating is not a new field. Uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, around for the last 60 years and in prehistory and uh, uh, other uh, periods uh, in archaeology, it was used uh, intensively before, but for the Iron Age, we started working on this only about 10 years ago. Now, this is just a short lesson. I'm not going to repeat it on radiocarbon uh, studies, how we do that, but what I'm trying to say in this uh, screen, showing you the small, very small carbonized uh, seeds of uh, wheat or barley, that we can date, one or two seats like this are enough to provide a date which is a, a plus minus 15 years for 3,000 years, which means if we are speaking about 3,000 years ago and we get a result which is plus minus 15, that is to say 30 or 3,000 years, 1%. I think 1% resolution is good for any uh, science, and uh, uh, this really provides us with the possibility to go to safely to historical reconstruction. For instance, this uh, palace, the foundations of this palace at Megiddo, which uh, um, uh, had traditionally been dated to the 10th century and related to the, days of, to the days of glory of the United Monarchy of King Solomon, according to radiocarbon investigation, dates in fact to the 9th century. Now this may sound a small thing to shift from the, uh, let's say, middle of the 10th century to the beginning of the 9th century. It's a matter of only 70 years or so, 60, 70 years, but it's, uh, it calls for a completely different a historical reconstruction because we are leaving the realm of the great united monarchy as described in the biblical text and moving to the time of the northern kingdom of Israel uh, and specifically to the time of the Omri dynasty, King Ahab maybe, or one of the monarchs of the same dynasty. In the same way we can reach really, we can, uh, we can construct, we can build a skeleton for dating the entire Iron Age, which is even more important than just uh, uh, date a single building. Here is an attempt to uh, date eight uh, horizons of destructions found, eight destruction horizons found in the archaeological mounds in Israel, and uh, with the, the help of radiocarbon, we can reach uh, precise dating, because if you imply, deploy the idea of stratigraphy and you are working with a strong uh, a statistical package, you can really diminish the uncertainty, get uh, good dates, and then, of course, relate these dates to historical events. And this is something which uh, calls for, uh, uh, in, uh, in many ways, for uh, a new history for uh, the uh, time of uh, the, Israel, the Hebrew kingdoms. Finally, let me just say a few words about the projects, a project which we are uh, carrying out right now. Uh, here is the team of this uh, uh, big project uh, 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 which uh, is funded by the European Research Council titled Reconstructing Ancient Israel, the Exact and Life Sciences Perspective with uh, 10 uh, tracks uh, dealing with various and uh, interesting topics such as radiocarbon research, human genetics, geoarchaeology, palynology, uh, 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 developing uh, algorithms in order to decipher uh, uh, and to compare uh, ancient Hebrew inscriptions, uh, residue analysis, that is to say, to detect uh, the uh, molecular imprint of uh, the material which uh, was stored in vessels, in pottery vessels, 3,000 years ago, and so on. And uh, in this uh, 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 
project, which is being carried out uh, by uh, Steve Einer from the uh, Weizmann Institute of Science and myself with uh, many colleagues, uh, university professors, postdocs, uh, uh, doctorate students. We are about 45 people all together. Not all of them are in, uh, this, uh, in this picture, many of them from the departments of physics, chemistry, mathematics, and so on. Let me uh, uh, demonstrate what we are doing just with the very, very briefly, in two, three minutes, give you uh, some of the, I mean, the breaking news, some of the new results from what we are doing. First of all, we export, we are in the, uh, decided to export the idea of uh, radiocarbon studies for the Iron Age to uh, the neighboring lands. Now, since we cannot export this today to Syria, unless uh, Itamar uh, does uh, something about it, uh, Assad would not, uh, I think, uh, welcome us enthusiastically. And since it's uh, becoming very difficult for us to work also in other uh, parts of the Middle East, uh, such as Turkey and Egypt, uh, we are going to Greece, where the, to the Aegean Basin, where the problem is the most annoying. Uh, the problem is that uh, in Greece uh, there is a very good knowledge of relative chronology based on styles, artistic styles of uh, pottery vessels. You can see here in the picture a uh, geometric, uh, geometric vase from the Iron Age from Greece. The problem is that there is a huge debate which encompasses the entire Mediterranean. People debate about it from Carthage in Tunisia in the, or Spain in the west all the way to the Levant in the east and Greece included in Italy. There's a big debate about this. How to date exactly these vessels which can date the entire uh, archaeology, the strata in, in different sites in the Mediterranean because they, are, they appear in, they were, uh, very, uh, they, they, they were uh, traded between uh, countries and they appear in almost in every layer of the Iron Age around the Mediterranean. And we are now working in several sites in Greece you can see here pictures uh, from Kalapodi, where we work with Heidelberg University, from uh, the excavation of Lefkandi. It's an excavation of Oxford. We are also working with the American Schools of Classical Studies. Two weeks ago, we were in Corinth in order to take uh, uh, samples, and we already see that we can really contribute meaningfully, significantly, to, the, uh, to secure a, a, a safe, uh, a, a da safe dating system for the Iron Age in Greece and also uh, uh, connect the archaeology of Greece in a safe way, in a secure way, to the archaeology of the Levant. Another fascinating uh, project that we are carrying out is uh, in palynology. Uh, pollen uh, found in a marine environment, in cores, in lakes such as the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee can help reconstruct the uh, paleoclimate and can help reconstruct uh, uh, settlement patterns and agriculture in the past uh, because the, of the winds in the Levant, which blow usually from uh, west to east. Uh, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee are ideal in order to extract cores for palynological research and uh, according to the cores, uh, 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 work on paleoclimate and uh, paleo uh, agriculture. The thing is that this uh, had been done before. We are not the first. However, most uh, works, or all works before, worked in a resolution of checking the palynology every, in a sample every 250 years or so. And we are working in a resolution of every 25 years, which is really something that has never been attempted before and uh, already uh, puts, in this case, not uh, 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 clear results, but very vague results, which uh, a call for explanations. I mean, we see things uh, which we did not expect. Uh, we see things which go con uh, in contradiction to what we expected from archaeology, from the settlement patterns in the highlands and so on. So this is another aspect of uh, what uh, we are uh, doing. Now, uh, under this title, How European Can a Middle Eastern Pig Be? Let me just uh, <coughs> give you another aspect Another aspect of what uh, we are doing, we are trying to go into ancient uh, DNA, we, which is a very treacherous job to carry out, and uh, we hope to be able in the near future to go into human DNA, uh, but we decided to start, we have established a laboratory, a DNA laboratory at uh, Tel Aviv University, and uh, 
uh, with the help of a postdoc, who, uh, Meirav Meiri, who came from uh, the United Kingdom after writing her PhD on this uh, matter, this subject in the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, we are now uh, working on uh, DNA of pigs. Why pigs? Because as you can see on the left-hand side and bottom, pigs are very important and they come in different percentages in different areas of the Levant. You can see without any difficulty, I think, that in the highlands there are no, almost no pigs. In the, there was no, almost, pork, almost no pork consumption in the Iron Age, while in Philistia, uh, the percentage of uh, pigs is high above the normal and uh, uh, it resembles, in a way, the percentage of pigs in uh, assemblages that are found in the Aegean Basin. And there has always been this idea that the, uh, this uh, high percentage of pigs in Philistia comes from import of pigs in the Iron One by, Iron One by the Philistines and other sea people. I can uh, tell you today that according to the, to the bones that we have already sampled, and we, it, it's quite a big sample, though it has to be intensified, I can uh, say, uh, at least for the time being, that in the Bronze Age, you know, there, there is a possibility, according to the DNA sequence, to make a distinction between European pigs and Middle Eastern pigs. Now, there is information, very strong information, about uh, pigs today. I mean, pigs were hunted, they are kept in museums, and you can go take a sample and conduct, carry out a DNA study. According to the studies, uh, not, not ours, but before, uh, we know that uh, um, all the countries around us, in Syria, in Eastern Anatolia, in other places in the Near East, the pigs are Middle Eastern pigs, while they are different from the European pigs. Now, uh, all, we tested already 11 pigs, modern pigs in Israel, from collections in museums. All of them are European pigs, to differ from what we see around us. And when we check the uh, DNA sequence, of ancient pigs, we see that in the Bronze Age, they are all uh, Middle Eastern pigs, and starting in the Iron 2A, which means in the late 10th century BC, we, can st we start seeing European pigs entering uh, the scene. Now, this is only, as I told you, breaking news, and we need to intensify, and we need to study many more uh, bones, and many more, take many more samples, and we are doing that. Last week at Megiddo, this is exactly what we did. We went to the storage of uh, excavations of 20 years in order to take more bones for our research, but this is really very exciting. Finally, let me just uh, mention one more uh, field, and I will close with this. This is residue analysis, a new, uh, well, relatively new method in archaeology. Uh, that is to say, an attempt to uh, uh, find the molecular uh, imprint of uh, the material which was uh, in uh, ancient uh, vessels, clay vessels. And uh, we uh, uh, are working on several types of uh, vessels uh, with some very interesting results. One of them is presented here. We are working on chalices. Chalices were used in cult. And they were used uh, in different parts of the Levant. Uh, and we are working for the time being on Philistine chalices. And uh, we have found uh, a molecular fingerprint of uh, hallucinogenic materials in uh, the chalices, which should make all of us happy. Uh, let me just uh, close by again uh, saying a few words about uh, Dan. Uh, I uh, really feel sorry that Dan cannot sit here and attend this uh, presentation. He would have been really thrilled to listen to all this. He was deeply interested. He was a real intellectual, as uh, 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 President Klafter and uh, Professor Rabinovitz uh, said before. He was, uh, I knew him well, and he was a very, very unique combination of an intellectual, a man with a very young spirit, a visionary, and a very, at the same time, a very a practical man, and we all miss him. Thank you very much. Maestro Zubin Mehta, 2007 Dan David Prize Laureate for the present time dimension in the field of music, was unfortunately unable to attend. However, he wanted to be a part of this evening and has sent a few words. 
Dan David, through his magnanimity and philanthropy, has taken giving in general to an incredibly high level, equal by very few individuals. Nancy and I greet both Gabriella and his family with all our love. He will be missed sorely and his contribution to life in general should be adhered by one and all. I'm a great fan of Dan David. The Israeli Philharmonic String Quartet, Ilya Konovalov, violin, Shmuel Glazer, violin, Dimitri Ratush, viola, and Felix Nemorovsky, cello, will perform quartet number 14 in D minor by Franz Schubert in recognition of Maestro Zubi Mehta.
you very much. The future held endless possibilities for Dan. Professor Amiram Grindwald, 2004 Dan David Price Laureate for the Future Time Dimension in the field of brain sciences, has turned some of these possibilities into reality. The title of his talk this evening is From Basic Brain Research to the Clinic. Professor Grindwald. It is a a very great uh, honor for me uh, to uh, speak to you in uh, this Memorial Day for uh, Mr. Dan David. Uh, Gabi, uh, I will remember him forever, of course. Same for the, his uh, family. And uh, I'm also indebted to uh, Tel Aviv University uh, for uh, getting the prize. Uh, getting the prize in the future time dimension is uh, not so easy. I'm often uh, jealous of those who got it in the past and can go relax on the beach. And uh, those that got it on the present may think about it as well, consider it, but those that got it for the future are really in a, a difficult situation uh, because they want to be nice to the referees of this distinguished prize. And by the way, I would like to say that the referees are excellent relative to uh, other institutions uh, in this small country. Uh, terrific uh, uh, decision over the years. So future is tough because you have to prove yourself. So I'm going to uh, take, talk, uh, talk to you about uh, my uh, research and also its application. Uh, this is an introduction to brain research and you're looking on a single nerve cell. And the single nerve cell, the cell body, you don't even see it, is a factory for uh, all kinds of things. What you see is the processes that receive information and send information to the 10 to the 13 nerve cells in uh, the human brain. Here you see uh, an animation. Actually, in real activity, everything light up, if you are thinking about electrical activity of the brain, as uh, a metaphor that neurons light up uh, when they talk to one another. And uh, to summarize what I did, I, I heard about this uh, metaphor that was uh, proposed by Lauren Sherrington, uh, 40 years ago, and I decided to make it come true, and uh, <clears throat> that's uh, what we were able uh, to do. So you see animation of electrical activity in a Japanese movie. Uh, here you see again a single nerve cell, and scientists know how to stain several uh, corners. Also here chemistry play a major role, and uh, you see all of the point of uh, contacts uh, between the cells, uh, the red, red nerve ending that talk to the other cell. And here, very enlarged, uh, is uh, the synapse, the point of uh, contact, and the uh, transmission uh, is uh, shown here. Electrical activity propagate down uh, the axon to the end of the synapse. Uh, and uh, release a chemical, chemistry again, uh, the, chemi the chemical uh, bind to the green cell, activate it, open uh, some holes called channels, selective, that uh, changes the electricity in the follower cell, and the message go on through a completely uh, <coughs> amazing network, uh, each cell can talk to uh, 10,000 uh, other cells and uh, receive the same. Uh, by the way, the overall uh, length of uh, cable in the head of Israel, anybody can guess? It, it goes 40 times around the globe and from here to the moon. So no wonder that all the computer companies uh, wants to understand how the brain uh, works. 
So here is one cell isolated, but actually it's a very elaborate network. You see the, the network, many other cells, and what you see here is only 1% of the cell that exists in this volume. So just imagine the complexity. But there is high degree of uh, organization here, and that would be the purpose of my uh, presentation today. So <laughs> this is a, a cut in the human brain, and the intelligent material is in the uh, surface of the brain, the cortex, to increase the area. It was folded, that's the gray matter. The white matter is a cable. And to put what you saw before, single nerve cell in proportion, we will get to a point <coughs> where uh, the movie will uh, stop, and uh, a certain area uh, here, I think, uh, would be marked and uh, enlarged. So the thickness of the cortex, the intelligence machine, uh, is only three millimeter, and these are the nerve cell. I'll jump, and uh, in the next uh, several short slides, I just want you to marvel about your own brain. So uh, anybody see uh, some kind of animals here? So there are at least uh, six horses here. Uh, here are the horses. This is, a, this is the head of one horse, the head of another horse, the head of another horse. There are two amazing things about this picture. One is that uh, after investing of uh, hundreds of million years in artificial uh, intelligence, computer with uh, all the foundation laid in generation, cannot readily identify such object as the uh, horses uh, uh, here, uh, but uh, humans can do it. Even more remarkable is the fact that those of you that could not identify the horses in this picture, next time they will see it, even in 10 years from now, will identify it immediately. Another remarkable thing about your brain is how without any information you can identify things that you are familiar with. So probably all of you recognize this person. Yeah? The president of the country. I'm really marveling how from very little information it's quite unique. So I had 20 pictures like that, but I'll show you only two more. This is from America. Uh, Bill Clinton. And uh, this one is known everywhere. So I think the brain is an amazing uh, computation machine. And by the way, visual information processing is the hardest task of the brain. And 55% of the brain are devoted to visual information processing. And you are all sinner because you are taking for granted the fact that you see. And you are not marveling and enjoying this fantastic machine that you got free from your uh, parents. Another uh, interesting thing about the brain is mistake that the brain uh, does. For example, this gorilla look much larger than this one, but it's a mistake that the brain, of the visual uh, processing because of the perspective in the image which show that unlike a, a camera or picture by the camera, our visual information processing is global. And consider the entire scene before it reaches a conclusion, what is going on. And again, there are uh, soldiers uh, standing here, the little one, even larger one, and a giant one. But actually, if you will take a ruler, you'll find out that the height of the three of them is exactly identical. So again, you are misled by the environment. And uh, <clears throat> there are uh, a lot of uh, medical application and uh, artificial intelligence application in which scientists are trying to imitate how the brain goes about uh, analysis in order to make it more powerful. Another mistake, here is a ball. And I think that uh, you see that the, the ball is running on the floor, but to most of you, it would appear as if now it jumped to the ceiling, uh, not to the ceiling, to the wall, high up. Again, a mistake, because it's on the floor. 
what causes mistake in your uh, processing is a shadow. So a child would not see this visual illusion. We were trained about shadows and we interpret pictures uh, according to where the shadow is. And another thing is a duality of uh, visual information processing with all the compliment that I get the visual system. It also, also uh, have uh, imperfection like ambiguity in the processing. And here uh, you can see a vase, but some of you who are thinking about faces can see the face of uh, Prince Charles uh, and uh, the Queen. So <clears throat> what we see is not always uh, what is out there. And I studied it a lot. It's a problem which is very interesting for sociology because it's true also for what you hear. And there is a lot of misunderstanding because what you see and what you hear is what you expect to see and hear and not really what's going on. I decided not to speak about it today, but talk a little bit about my work. Uh, here is an heroic experiment trying to understand how vision works. And that experiment won a Nobel Prize in uh, 1984. So very simple. Everyone can do it. Uh, you have a subject. The subject is looking on a very simple target, bar of light. Uh, and an electrode uh, is uh, inserted and hooked for a speaker. That's an electrode, a wire with an edge next to a cell and it can pick up the electrical activity of the cell. What they did is they played it into a speaker, so they created a situation where you can hear what you see. So here is a movie from, wow. Here is a movie from their pioneering work. The noise is electrical activity. So actually, you are hearing what the cell is seeing in real time. And uh, that's, uh, the cell is looking on the light bar. And <clears throat> simply by listening, you can see that uh, the, our vision is working in a way that each nerve cell, it's a recording from a single nerve cell, is responsible to tell his friends what's going on in a certain territory, marked here in red. But it's more remarkable than that. No response. No response again. There was no response when the bar was horizontal. Great response when it's vertical. So these cells in the visual cortex are sensitive for the orientation of the stimulus. They don't care about its color. When this black thing is vertical, uh, they respond. The movie lasts for two hours. Let's go to the next topic. <laughs> so I joined the uh, Weasel Lab in uh, 1984 uh, <clears throat> because uh, he, he invited me to join him because with a single electrode you can record from one cell, but the visual cortex has a, a, a large area with a hundred million of cells and it become important to go to the next step and understand how the brain is organized. Is it organized uh, functionally in a nice way, let's say like uh, New York, or uh, is it like the refugee camp? So at that time, I was uh, already had some expertise with optical imaging, and based on the old one, I figured out how to do it for the intact brain. So what you are seeing here are the blood vessel overlying the exposed uh, brain of a subject. And it was known that when uh, in, in uh, a certain area, some piece of cortex is devoted to right eye input and another one to the left eye. So this is a picture taken when the left eye was uh, open and this one when it was closed. <clears throat> there is no difference, but if you subtract one picture from the other one, you see the very subtle difference between the two that is related to the different electrical activation of the brain. 
here I have to multiply the difference by 10,000 after subtracting the two nearly identical pictures to see this difference by 10,000. But signal to noise is nice, and you see very clear columnar organization. This is looking on the brain from the top. You put electrode here, you see that the black area responds only to input to the right eye, and here only to the input uh, to the left eye. And here, it doesn't matter which eye you stimulate, there is a, a response and you can identify the border. Actually, when somebody saw that, he said, wow, without any uh, invasive material, uh, you can see functional border. That's very useful for neurosurgery, and I'll show you what we did about that. How do we see the invisible and, and, and use it to chart the, the brain? Well, we use a, 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 an observation from the beginning of the previous century, 1903, that uh, the, when the brain is active, it consumes oxygen. Oxygen in the arteries is uh, rich uh, in the arteries, and uh, therefore the color of the arteries is red, and in the vein, it's uh, bluish. So if there is electrical activity in this area, all the capillaries uh, would uh, transfer the oxygen to uh, the nerve cells that uh, demand it, demanded it. They also want the compensation, the brain cell. And these uh, red blood cells become, lose the red color. In an area where there is no activity, they would remain red. So it is this small subtle difference that uh, we are seeing when we subtract one picture from the other and different area were uh, stimulated in each. So now we are back to the orientation, which is the reason why I moved to New York. Uh, here is the brain. This is one stimulus, horizontal line. There are black patches uh, that consume the oxygen. You change the stimulus and there are patches somewhere else. So now you can use different orientation, all of them. Uh, this is horizontal, uh, uh, vertical, etc. <coughs> and what you get is this uh, uh, functional map after you combine all the maps that I show uh, before to ask which point in the image respond in the largest uh, scale. So this was not like the observation uh, reported by the Nobel laureate and it gave us uh, some hard time. Uh, we discovered that there is a radial organization rather than a parallel one. And <clears throat> these are the building block of the large area of cortex that you saw before. Here are four different ones, five now not cut out. Uh, that's the picture. Uh, people uh, somehow doubted uh, the, the color images, so we decided to show it in black and white. Here are the eight pictures. This is the orientation, horizontal, less than horizontal, and you see that there is a, a radial organization just like the color. So sometimes black and white and letting the eye do the processing give you the best result. We continue to chart the visual cortex for many other parameters, not only orientation and right eye input, but color processing, direction, selectivity, uh, etc. And uh, what you're seeing here is a three by two millimeter of a, a cortex and the color code, a code for region with different response property, vertical, horizontal, color, etc. It's a magnification of this small point here uh, on the brain and yet another uh, magnification. So this uh, technology was used by uh, many groups because it was more powerful than anything that uh, was available before and was used to chart the cortex and uh, in the same way that we should marvel uh, about the fact that we see effortlessly and we hear without any difficulty even though cells are consuming energy and the brain and the eye consume energy more than uh, anything. Uh, here uh, we should marvel about uh, the talent of the architect who structure the organization of the brain with respect to function in uh, such a meticulous uh, way. And physicists claim that this organization is actually 
minimizing the overall lengths of wires required to connect distant cell to one another. So a lot of theoreticians are working on these functional maps. Uh, so to the clinical application, here uh, is a map that you are familiar with of the column, but now color coded before you saw it in uh, black and white. And here there are no column at uh, the top. So you see the functional border between area number one primary visual cortex that is sensitive to which eye was looking and that the basis of depth perception and the other area. So here we are in a, a Sloan Kettering after they notice that uh, the, we can identify functional border. Uh, here I am at uh, Sloan Kettering after putting all the Weizmann lab on a, a truck and a jet and unloading it in, uh, in Sloan Kettering uh, to participate in uh, neurosurgery. And uh, for a scientist to spend his life uh, day and night doing uh, research, it's quite an experience uh, to be in a hospital and uh, try to, try to uh, use it uh, for something that may be helpful uh, for uh, human. So <coughs> the question, I, I was in a, in a surgery before we participated and I saw that the chief neurosurgery and his assistant were arguing where is the border between the hand uh, sensation and uh, controlling hand uh, movement. This is like uh, arguing uh, where is Fifth Avenue in, in uh, New York. And one say, it's here, and uh, the other one said, no, it's here. And only one was right, and the one who was wrong, if he would uh, adapt the surgical procedure based on his information, the person would remain either paralyzed or uh, worse uh, than uh, dead. So you need to identify the function before you do the resection, and uh, this is what we do in uh, this uh, experiment. And uh, I, I want to also jump here. There was a, a person with uh, a tumor next to the right hand, and uh, we, we, uh, this is an exposed uh, brain uh, during neurosurgery. And by optical imaging, we got a map of the hand representation, which we tickled. And we told the uh, physician, the neurosurgeon, that uh, this is the sensory representation of the hand. So he didn't think so, and was a moment of uh, attention, and uh, because make such a critical decision based on uh, experimental technique is not so good. But uh, we came up with uh, an alternative way that uh, was uh, invented uh, three decades ago. It's complicated, so people do not use it in real surgery and trust their judgment and make mistakes. Anyway, this confirmed it, and the next day it was really rewarding to uh, press uh, the person in. Now, after that, I decided to move to the retina and use exactly the same technology in order to diagnose tough diseases that leads to blindness in, in millions of people. So uh, this is uh, the eye, the optics, and here there is a, a thin layer of a nerve cell, part of the brain, that is unique because it has photoreceptor cells that are sensitive to light and they convert light which is a, come from, from an image just like a camera falling on the retina. Uh, they convert it to electricity with multiple cell and send fibers that goes to the brain. <laughs> this is the most active uh, part of the body and it has a, a, a radiator built behind it in order to cool it. Really an amazing device. Normal vision. Now, what happens if you suffer from glaucoma? This is what you see. Your field of view shrinks and you see only the center. It's a progressive slow process. 
This is AMD, Age Macular Degeneration. <laughs> there are about uh, 350 million uh, that are going to uh, become blind because of age macular degeneration. At the age of uh, 70, uh, a third of the population start to develop age macular degeneration. And this is uh, the, the same picture for a diabetic retinopathy that uh, every diabetic patient is uh, likely to get sooner or later. And part of the visual field is uh, de completely damaged so that uh, you see black, uh, uh, nearly impossible to drive this way, and the end is complete uh, blindness. So I heard that there are missing tools to, for early diagnosis. By the way, there is a huge progress in, in uh, pharmacotic uh, treatment in which billions are uh, invested, and in the last uh, five, ten years, uh, there are drugs that uh, are used to uh, treat these uh, diseases and for a devastating AMD and diabetic retinopathy. In 90% of the cases, if there is early diagnosis, the available treatment, which is not a cure but stop the progression, uh, is uh, useful and uh, you're not, uh, you will not lose your vision if you're treated early enough. So here is an instrument uh, which we built. Uh, I don't know why this movie does not play, so we'll see it here. The retinal function imager incorporates fundus camera technology. You don't have to listen to this imaging. nonsense. The RFI listen. analyzes the high quality Only image when sequences I'll tell you obtained to, listen, to extract you will hear detail, what's special in this device. As just one example. It takes a series of fast images, <laughs> uh, so you end up with the movie instead of a sick now. The photography procedure for all the RFI's parameters is similar. Once the camera is aligned and focused, the photographer presses the trigger. That's Eight retinal images the, are rapidly acquired. The series of, uh, images Image sequences and preliminary analysis that, uh, results can be quickly us, reviewed during the brief exam. Gave us uh, eight images. And because we have eight images that look identical, just like the case that I saw you uh, for the brain, right eye input, left eye input, no difference, the same is true here. But since the pictures are taking a different time, and since the red blood cells are moving, if you subtract one image from the other one, you will see the movement. And that's what you're looking here. Uh, red, it's artificial color. You'll see it also in uh, black and white. So how do we see it? Uh, here is an explanation. <coughs> this is figure number, uh, this is frame number one in a patient with a diabetic. And this is frame number two. You see that there is almost no difference between the frames, slight movement. They are nearly identical. So in frame number one, a red blood cell, which here is white, uh, is in this position in the, in the vessel. In frame number two, it's in this position. Uh, and since you don't see the individual cell, they have a minute contrast, you don't see much, but if you subtract this from that, you get a, a point where the current red blood cell is because there is absorption of light. And here there is no longer absorption of light, so after subtraction it appears white. So if you play the entire movie rather than uh, one vessel, you, that's the raw data of the device. You see the blood flow, the dark uh, spot are the red blood cell and the, the white are the empty interval between them. So red blood cells move in cluster and we can see also black dot that are also individual red blood cells but in capillary and in this way we have an ability to see flow only in the large uh, vessel. Uh, but uh, capillaries are even more important for early diagnosis. Here is a, a, a large area, and we can uh, uh, quantify the flow velocity in terms of millimeter per second. By the way, it may be true for every organ in the body. We tried only the brain. and uh, So I'm finishing. Uh, 
with the explanation how we see the capillary. So this is a movie of 40 images, and you see the, red, the, the large red blood cell, but there is a meshwork of capillary that you don't see. In order to see it, you subtract the average of all of these images, so you get rid of the static information, and you end up with this movie. And we have sophisticated algorithms that analyze this movie and ask whether these small spots are noise or individual red blood cells in a capillary, and the result of the algorithm is here. This is not a picture, it's a result of a computation. So you can see capillaries, and uh, that's uh, quite valuable. Uh, here is a picture of the retina that you saw before. This is a gold standard result, which is essential in order to see capillary. It was invented 50 years ago, still being used because it's so important and has no substitute until we came up with this non-invasive way that originated from uh, brain research. So this is what we can do. And as you can see, it's much better, much more detailed than the gold standard. It's non-invasive, so you can do it repeatedly and for early diagnosis and uh, guidance of uh, treatment and follow-up of treatment would be much better. So that's the end result. We, we ended with a device that is better than the gold uh, standard. In disease, you see area without any capillaries in diabetic retinopathy retinopathy patient. They have also leaks from their uh, micro uh, vessels, which you see if you uh, swallow a uh, fluorescein. And uh, that's a clinical uh, product. So thank you very much, and I hope that this is the beginning of the future. Perhaps uh, the, the most important part uh, <coughs> above the acknowledgement uh, to uh, Dan David family and uh, to Lviv University is uh, my conclusion. Uh, there should be much, much stronger support uh, in this country for uh, expensive, uh, expensive research in many, many areas. Uh, I think the government uh, does not understand it does not see what's uh, its value, and uh, as you know, and you read in the paper, it's absolutely important to support basic brain research without any goal. Eventually, a fraction of those go very far. Thank you. The Name Your Hero essay competition for high school students in which youth write about their heroes was very dear to Dan's heart. He saw it in this enterprise, a way of fostering the next generation of leaders in various fields. I would like to invite Shira Malka, winner of the Name Your Hero essay competition in 2005, to say a few words. Shira. Good evening, honorable guests. My name is Shira Malka, and I'm 25 years old sociology student at Tel Aviv University, finishing soon my bachelor's degree. I am honored and privileged to be here tonight, and I would like to read a letter I wrote in the memory of Mr. Dan David Zichon In 2005, I attended the youth essay competition, Name Your Hero. I wrote an essay about NGOs for the hungry, hunger in developed countries. This was the first time I heard about the late, late Mr. Dan David and his extensive life's work. It was also the first time I had the privilege to get to know of a man who deci decided to use his wealth to promote areas of research for the benefit of humanity. And although I did not know him personally, he was able to affect many young people like me. For the first time through this competition, I have been exposed to the unlimited generosity of Mr. David that rose from his vision of the way society should be. By inventing the automated photo cells, Mr. David metaphorically presents a mirror image of his vision of the Israeli society, 
a small community that raises youth with diversified interests and rewards worthy scientists and young inventors. The image that he visualized presented uh, an optimistic view of the society the way it should be. In the 2009 Dan David Award Ceremony, former president of Tel Aviv University, Professor Tzvi Galil, stated that the Name Your Hero competition enable, enables a unique peek into the cultural world of the Israeli youth. This youth is filled with, an, with intellectual curiosity, seeks knowledge along with social sensitivity, vision and care. The diversified and inspiring topics of their essays touch different areas of life, people, and a wide range of life's arenas. I agree with this statement that this competition gives us a unique view into the cultural world of youth, but in addition, it also opened a window into Mr. David's world and his great faith in Israel's youth from all over Israel, from the periphery and the center of the country. By having this competition, he gave us youth the opportunity to present our point of view of the world and to be able to reward people and institutions, some of which are hidden from the spotlights. In this great vision, he gave us, the competition participants, the opportunity to illuminate those important people and institutions. I had the great privilege to meet Mr. David and to be honored in the opportunity his initiative gave me, to express my point of view and more importantly, to learn that my point of view counts, it is important and that is worth hearing. This was the first and most valuable lesson I learned in my academic path. And it, the, it is the lesson that gave me confidence to continue towards advanced academic degrees and to choose an acad academic career. And in that lies my absolute knowledge that his soul will be bound in the bond of my life forever. The more I read about Mr. David's life and, the, and learn about him, I understand how much his life's work and has touched so many people around the world. At the same time, and because of that, I feel a great missed opportunity that I did not actually get to know more of this warm and hearty man personally, whom, as I understand, was always open and accessible to all. If it was possible, I would like to thank him personally for the profound change he made in my life and for the high sense of competence he rooted in me. Through winning this in the essay competition, and lastly, I would like to thank him for teaching me to always believe in myself, like he said in his own words. The main thing I learned was to believe in myself. Thank you. I would like now to invite to the stage Gabriela and Ariel David. Good evening to all of you. Thank you all for coming to remember Dan with Ariel and myself and with my family, and thank you professors for coming here, for lecturing us, for giving us from your great wisdom. Thank you a lot. I have only a few words to say to you, personal words, but it's in the form of a letter. I wrote a letter to my husband. I wrote a letter to Dan, who gave me 32 beautiful years. First of all, he gave me this child. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad at all. And very rich, very interesting life. He carried me with his curiosity to all places, to all faces, to whatever you want. So I'll cut it short. I'll just read you a short letter I wrote to him last week.
Ciao, Dan. I'm now at the university, the institution you had so much respect for and felt so attached to. And I'm sending my thoughts out to you in this letter. We are surrounded by many friends whose love embraces us and helps us to ease the fact for Ariel, our son, and myself that you've gone far, far, far away where there are no blackberries, emails, or telephone calls which you enjoyed so much. These days, I have very long conversations with you in my mind, searching for your approval of my, deal, my deeds and your agreement with my choices, and I even sometimes playfully discuss with you simple everyday events. If I'm upset over a trivial matter, I can hear you telling me, you are right, but always that but, how it used to get on my nerves. However, today I understand this but. And once again, I understand you are right. I, I miss you. When reading a book and stumbling upon an historical fact you are not around to give me a full lecture on the subject, and my questions remain unanswered. Forgive me for not following your favorite television series, Bewitched, with the sweet magician Samantha, whom you were so fond of, all because you're not beside me laughing your head off like a little boy. I do watch document documentaries and historical films, and I can always hear you saying the dates and names of places or personalities before the presenter even has time to mention them. Since you're not playing chess on the computer every night with someone somewhere in the world and shouting, what an idiot I am. What a wrong move did I do now. I wonder whether maybe, maybe a very big maybe, you're now playing chess with my late father. Actually, why not? You always wanted to play against him and obviously to win, but I will not have a favorite and I will instead side with both of you. Life, life goes on as usual. The world has not come to, stall, uh, to stand still, nor has it stopped for a second, not even to catch its breath, as if Nothing has happened. For me, something awful and overpowering happened. It is the same for Ariel and for many others who love and miss you terribly. Maybe from where you are now, you will finally learn how to send an SMS and tell us that you are well. I love you. Thank you, Gabi, for sharing your thoughts and feelings with us. To conclude this evening, I would like to share with you a few words from Dan's last speech at the 2011 award ceremony. In the last decade, we have welcomed here at Tel Aviv University 58 laureates, 58 friends who received prizes 
in the three time dimensions. Exceptional individuals who helped us to understand our past, to build our present, and to dream our future. He continued by saying that you and your descendants after you should continue to follow the prize for many generations to come. Thank you. <laughs>